Hello everyone, welcome back to the Genomics Bootcamp to a series about linkage disequilibrium. In this video, we just start to talk about this genomic phenomenon. So therefore the question, what it is exactly? So what is linkage disequilibrium? And you will know it from this video. Before we start, let's activate some of our prior knowledge that you might know from this channel or from other sources. And the, the two most important issues to highlight here is one that the single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs exist. These are some markers that are widely used and currently, in my opinion, the most important marker types as for the genomics. Tens of thousands of such SNPs are being genotyped in a cost-effective way on the entire genome. So basically, it is a very good way to get to know something about the genomes themselves. And the other bit of information that is important here is the existence of the recombinations or recombination events that are of major biological importance. This means that the nucleotides on our genome are not being inherited independently, but in a form of shorter or longer genomic segments from the paternal and maternal side. Such statement about the non-independent inheritance is in conflict with the Mendel's law of independent assortment, which says genes do not influence each other with regard to the sorting of alleles into genes and every possible combination of alleles for every gene is equally likely to occur. Mendel's law is of course valid when the genes or the parts of the genome are far from each other or for example on separate chromosomes, but as you will see it's not valid when these genes or SNPs or parts of the genome are very close to each other. The next few slides I took from the presentation of Professor Henner Simianer from University of Göttingen to demonstrate what happens in such occasions and what in fact the linkage disequilibrium is. So for the sake of simplicity, let's have an individual with two alleles and we ensure that this individual is entirely heterozygous. Then we mate it with another, another individual which is entirely homozygous for these alleles A and B. And when the law of independent assortment is valid, then we get the four possible genotypes. And if our sample is big enough, then we have all these possible genotypes with a 25% of probability. So in the, our population, we would see that all four genotypes appear in a proportion of 25%. In some cases, however, we might notice that these four genotypes are in fact not appearing in an equal proportion, but very, very differently from each other. In this case, the alleles denoted by the capital letters A and B seem to appear much more frequently together. And also the alleles denoted by the lowercase a and b are also appear to occur much more frequently with each other. So in this case 45% in comparison to a situation when the lower case A, for example, and the higher case B uh, would be together in a single individual. The reason for this is, of course, recombination. So we have a non-recombinant gametes on the one side and the recombined gametes on the other side. So in other words, again, in case a recombination happened between these two loci, then we have a different occurrence for these, uh, for these gametes. The degree of recombinations is measured by the recombination rate. So what we see is a departure from this equal distribution denoted as a linkage disequilibrium or LD, which is the very frequently used abbreviation. I wanted to underline that LD is in fact a parameter of the population, so you need more individuals and in the best case scenario, a large number of individuals to determine the LD between two loci in a population. It is in fact a non-random association between the loci within this population, which could be measured. So we can tell that the two loci is strongly linked or weakly linked or not linked at all together. In other words, the LD tells us something about the strength of the information if we see an allele in a certain locus and what it can tell us about the occurrence of an other allele on an other locus. There are various methods to measure LD and we will talk about these 
measurement possibilities in the next video. So here is an example of a part of a genome with a heat map. So here is basically the darker colors are high LD and lighter colors are low LD. So it's measured with D prime in this example. Don't worry about this right now. But basically what I want to show you that the SNPs that are close to each other tend to have a higher LD between each other and they are, for example, SNPs, for example, number nine and number 20, you see that there are relatively lower LD between them. Also, there are segments on the genome that are so-called LD blocks, where all the pairwise combinations of the SNPs yield a high LD. So basically, this whole block is in, inherited in one piece. I really like this picture about the LD block structure in this particular case in a chicken genome that demonstrates a similar thing as in a previous picture or previous slide, but on a much larger part of the genome. Also, it compares two chicken lines where we see that the same part of the genome could be very different even within the species when we talk about different breeds or in this case, different lines. And the reason for this could be that, for example, in this chicken breed, in this particular part of the genome, there are some genes that are very important for this breed. Therefore, this part of the genome is quite well conserved with a very high pairwise LDs in this part. And the same genes are, of course, present also in the other breed but in this breed are not important or at least not selected for. Therefore, we do not see such a strong LD block occurring in this breed. This simple picture is supposed to illustrate the use of LD and why is it important in the genomics as such. So what we have here is, let's say, a chromosome and we have a SNPs on them. And let's say we did some kind of analysis where we found the significance of each SNP. So this would be the higher the SNP is, the higher the significance level. Now, we see that there we have a, some kind of a signal here. So the question is, is this the gene of interest that influences our trait? Of course, because we are speaking about SNPs that are themselves just markers and not the causal variant. So this is in fact not the gene of interest, but actually just shows what region of the genome is interesting for our case. So we have a region of interest here and most likely the exact gene of interest resides somewhere here. Now the size of this region is determined by the linkage disequilibrium, so LD, because most likely this uh, SNP, the, the highest significant SNPs, is connected to all of these nucleotides around. Also that the parts of the genome that were not observed and therefore helps us to find the gene that is actually interesting for us. So to sum up why is LD important, it actually defines how, uh, how far we are allowed to or supposed to look from the detected markers when we are looking for the causality on our genome. And it shows the association strength between the observed SNPs and the unobserved genes or QTLs. Also, I want to underline that the LD itself is actually dependent on a population or species. So most likely these association strengths or the, in these regions or the size of the regions might differ between the different populations. As for the applications of LD in genomics, it is really, really wide ranging. So I just mentioned a few examples here. So in evolutionary biology, it allows us to reflect on past events and gives insight into evolutionary history. When it comes to genetic diversity, it's a, well, a similar as in a previous point, but we often compute the effective population size for our populations. And this uh, one of the computation methods is via LD itself. Then we can tell something about the artificial or natural selection events on the genome when it again comes to the population with the so-called selection signatures and the genetic hitchhiking. 
these are events when the actual selected gene drags along part of the surrounding genome and appearing in a population as a selection signature. So this size is determined by the LD itself. My small schematics showed an example of a genome-wide association study where we could search for causal genes. And as it was mentioned there, we could locate our search to these interesting regions where the most important or most significant SNPs reside. And LD is also used in a genomic selection in an indirect way. So here the question is that how many SNPs we need that are more or less equally distributed on the genome. So the whole genome is covered. So we could detect these very small QTLs and very small genes that affect our trait of interest, which is usually a quantitative trait. So it is influenced by many genes of small effect. We need to ensure that the whole genome is covered properly so that all of these small genes are connected to at least one SNP in a high enough LD and therefore taken into account when the genomic breeding value is calculated. So again, a slide to give an answer to the initial question, what is linkage disequilibrium? So linkage disequilibrium is a parameter that quantifies the non-random association between the loci. It shows if the frequency of a different alleles between two loci is higher or lower than it would be expected if the loci, loci were independent from each other and associated randomly. And the very last summary slide for the entire presentation, we talk about SNP markers that allow to track the associations between parts of the genome and such associations and such connections could be non-random, especially if the SNPs or markers or parts of the genome are very close to each other. Such non-random association is called the linkage disequilibrium or LD in a shortened abbreviated form. And there are wide ranging applications of LD within genomics. In the following videos, we will continue with the exact measurement techniques of the linkage disequilibrium. Also, I will provide a very nice hands-on example, but of course, also show the way how it, the LD is computed for large data sets using Plink. For today, I thank you for your time and see you at another video on the Genomics Bootcamp channel. I wish you a very nice day.